God has sent a special messenger to all of us in the person of Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovic, a Sister of Charity of St. Elizabeth. Her baptismal name was Teresa Demjanovic. She was a young American woman who lived a saintly life in the early 20th century. Today God sends each of you a special message. It is the promise found in the Gospel story by John. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we shall come to him and make our home with him. This is a universal call to holiness. It is addressed to everyone. God wants all of us to be saints. On March 26, 1901, Teresa Demjanovic was born in the New York area in the city of Bayonne, New Jersey. Her parents, Alexander and Joanna, were simple, devout, hard-working immigrants from what is now Slovakia. The family belonged to the Byzantine Ruthenian Catholic Church, St. John the Baptizer, in Bayonne, and Teresa was baptized and confirmed in that rite when she was five days old. Teresa was the youngest of the living Demjanovic children. Two babies died early in the marriage. Here we see John, Mary, and Anna. Teresa's siblings reported that they did not suspect the depth of her spirituality as they were growing up. To Mary, John, Anna, and Charles, she was a very intelligent and good baby sister. Her sister Mary tells us that Teresa was quiet, unassuming, and obedient. Growing up, Teresa was especially close to her brother Charles. This loving relationship persisted during her whole life. Later, Charles attended Seton Hall Seminary and was ordained a priest and became a Monsignor in the Archdiocese of Newark. Because there was no Catholic school within a reasonable walking distance of their home, the Demjanoviches went to the Bayonne Public Schools. However, their religious instruction was not neglected since St. John Byzantine Church conducted religion classes every day after school and Teresa was faithful in attendance. She made her first Holy Communion in that parish at the age of 12. The family moved to Northern Bayonne and Teresa attended Bayonne High School. The Demjanovitz children took part in the liturgy, social events, and the activities at St. Vincent Roman Catholic Parish. During these years, Teresa went to Mass frequently and experienced a deepening of her spiritual life. She exhibited superior scholastic ability and was chosen to give the salutatory address at graduation. She was only 16 years old when she graduated from high school. There was no doubt in Teresa's mind with regard to her vocation. She wanted to live her life entirely for God and to give herself wholly to Him. Religious life seemed best suited for the realization of her ideal. Even at 16, she thought she might become a contemplative Carmelite. However, she faced the reality of her family situation. Her mother was ill and her health was gradually deteriorating. The responsibilities of nurse and housekeeper fell on Teresa's shoulders. Teresa was always cheerful and washed and ironed and cooked and cleaned without complaining. She always had a smile for everyone. Here she is pictured with Bayonne's oil tanks in the background. Teresa's life made her more mature and serious than the average young girl. She continued to attend daily mass and was active in church affairs at St. Vincent. When her mother died in 1918, Teresa experienced great sorrow. In September of 1919, keeping a promise that they had made to their dying mother, Mr. Demjanovic and the other older children insisted that Teresa go to college. They told her it was the only sensible path for her with her intellectual abilities. She really wanted to leave home and join the Carmelite nuns. However, she submitted good-naturedly to her family and registered for the College of St. Elizabeth. Teresa attended the College of St. Elizabeth. 
This institution is a woman's college sponsored by the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth of New Jersey. Founded in 1899, it was the first Catholic college in New Jersey that awarded degrees to women. It has an excellent reputation for scholarly instruction. It is located in suburban Morris County in northern New Jersey. Teresa was a superb college student. She excelled and manifested a depth of understanding in all fields of study. Many of her courses were given in this lecture hall, Santa Maria. She was also active in extracurricular activities, wrote poetry for the college anthology, took part in plays, was a member of the Spanish Club, and was editor of the class yearbook. She was always ready to go to New York for a day and enjoyed shopping and the theater and concerts. She enjoyed all kinds of sports and was on the track team. As one of her classmates said, she was truly an all-around girl. During her college years, Teresa attended early Mass in the convent chapel each day, and she would spend any free time she had making visits to the Blessed Sacrament. She said the stations prayerfully. However, she carefully guarded the secrets of her interior life. To her friends, she was just a good, normal, capable young woman. A friend said that she always knew that Teresa was thoroughly good and more than ordinarily prayerful, but she could hardly believe that Teresa experienced the phenomena of a mystical life. Teresa tried not to give any signs of her sanctity to those around her. She found peace and quiet praying in the chapel. In the midst of the distractions of classes and extracurricular activities, she kept her soul united with God. As a college girl, Teresa was assigned to Santa Rita Residence Hall. She lived on the fourth floor. Her room number was 408. Here, Teresa studied, chatted with her friends, and here she prayed. Next door to Teresa's room was the room of her best friend, Agatha Spinelli, from Patterson, New Jersey. Agatha called Teresa Treat, and Teresa called her Spin. The two girls were good friends and had the habit of exchanging good nights before they retired. Whoever was ready for bed first would go to the room of the other. One evening, Spin found Treat sitting on the window seat. She could not sleep. Spin asked why. Teresa answered that at about 11 o'clock p.m. the night before, when she was praying her rosary, kneeling on the window seat, the heavens outside her window grew brighter and brighter, and our Blessed Mother appeared in the midst of all the light. The light and beauty overpowered her and she could not move. Then the Blessed Mother disappeared and the light faded and Teresa stayed there kneeling until it was time for Mass. Teresa told Agatha, All day yesterday and today I could not keep my mind on anything else but the sweetness and beauty of it all. So now you know why I cannot sleep. You will never tell anyone, will you? Agatha kept her promise and did not reveal the vision until after Teresa's death. Teresa's room, number 408, on the fourth floor of Santa Rita, has been preserved and today is set aside as the Sister Miriam Teresa Conference Room. It is used for meditation and meetings. The window seat from which she saw the Virgin is carefully safeguarded. In May 1923, Teresa graduated from St. Elizabeth College, summa cum laude, with highest honor. She was still in doubt as to her future, but her friends thought she would enter the Carmel or the Novitiate at convent. She longed for the contemplative life, but she was not accepted by Carmel. This may have been because of her poor eyesight. God had something else in store for her. Teresa and some of her fellow graduates stayed at convent for a few days after graduation. Teresa wanted especially to pray about her future. If God did not want her in Carmel, what did he want her to do? Teresa decided to wait and continued to pray about her vocation until God made clear how she was to serve him. 
In the meantime, she intended to teach and applied for a position at St. Aloysius Academy in Jersey City. She was an excellent teacher, but had a mischievous class of girls. Among other things, they deliberately mispronounced her last name, but she always manifested a calm demeanor. Ordinarily, she was serious, but she did relax on occasion. When June came, she was happy to be relieved of her school duties and returned to keeping house for her family. Teresa's best sister friend at the college wrote her a letter and advised her not to wait too long if she wanted to enter the Sisters of Charity. Sister suggested they make a novena in honor of Our Lady since the Feast of the Immaculate Conception was approaching. She promised to ask the other sisters who knew Teresa to pray with them. On the Saturday after the feast day, Teresa came to convent and surprised the sisters. She wanted to petition to enter the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth. Teresa wrote of her decision to enter. I felt that should the earth tremble and quake and the stars from heaven fall around me, nothing could disturb my calm. My confidence and trust in Him were so absolute that I was amazed. I was certain that I was His spouse. God wanted Teresa to become a sister of charity. In Teresa's own words, God's purpose in my life is to teach men our Lord's promise. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. This promise is held out to every soul regardless of calling. She was inspired to remind all of us about the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in our souls. On February 2, 1925, Teresa's father died and she did not enter on that day as originally planned. She was willing to go to the convent after the funeral, but the sisters postponed her entrance until February 11th, the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes. Leaving her family in the convent parlor, she was brought upstairs to change into the postulant dress and cap. After a visit with her family, Teresa hugged and kissed them goodbye and began her life as a Sister of Charity. On March 17, 1925, Sister Miriam Teresa donned the novice habit and cap and was given her religious name. She requested Miriam after the Blessed Virgin and Teresa after her baptismal patron, St. Teresa of Avila. Sister Miriam Teresa was an exemplary novice. She carefully kept the rule and customs of the community. She not only prayed the required spiritual exercises, but she also did her housekeeping charge conscientiously. In all things, she conformed exactly to the common life. One fellow novice commented that no one ever saw her breaking the smallest part of the rule. Despite her aversion to teaching, she was assigned to the Academy of St. Elizabeth on the Mother House grounds. At that time, the Academy was a boarding school. Sister Miriam did her part in taking care of the boarders. She ate in the Academy's refectory and slept in the girls' dormitory. One student recalled that Sister Miriam gave up her own pillow to a child who could not sleep from coughing. She went to school every day and faithfully fulfilled her teaching duties because it was God's will for her. At this time, the Reverend Benedict Bradley, a Benedictine from St. Mary Abbey in Morristown, was the appointed chaplain and confessor for the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth. The first week after Teresa's entrance, the novice mistress, Sister Mary Ellen, told Father that she thought there was a mystic among the new novices. As Sister Miriam's spiritual director, he heard her confessions and soon realized that he was advising a very holy person. As part of Father Benedict's duties, he gave weekly conferences to the novices. 
Realizing Sister Miriam Teresa's holiness, he asked the Mother Superior if he could ask Sister Miriam to write a series of conferences for him. Sister Miriam was not to let anyone know that she was the author of Father Benedict's talks. Not even her mistress was to know what she was doing. Later, these talks were published in a book called Greater Perfection. Requests for this book have come from all over the world. It has been translated into Chinese, French, Italian, Dutch, Spanish, and Slovak. Near the mother house at convent, there is a wooded area where Sister Miriam Teresa and the novices walked and prayed and even played baseball. It is an ideal spot for meditation and prayer. One day in the late afternoon, Sister Miriam was told by her mistress to go out and get some fresh air. She wanted to be obedient, but it was getting dark. Because she taught school and was on a different schedule than the other novices, she could not find another sister to accompany her. So she prayed to the new saint, Saint Therese of Lisieux, and asked her to walk with her. To her surprise, the little flower came in person to walk in Nazareth Park. In Nazareth Park, there is a commemorative statue of Saint Therese, the Carmelite saint who had only recently been canonized at the time she appeared at convent in 1925. She and Sister Miriam walk through the park and around the crucifix and back to the door of the novitiate. Afterwards, Sister Miriam gave an account of the vision to Sister Marie Dolores, who told us that Sister Miriam's face shone with a heavenly radiance when she spoke to her about it that evening. Before Sister Miriam Teresa took vows as a Sister of Charity, she made a vow of greater perfection with the permission of her confessor, Father Benedict. Sister Miriam promised always to aim at what was most perfect in thought, word, and deed. Many holy Christians make this special vow quietly and secretly live holy lives in the midst of their ordinary, everyday duties in the world. Sister Miriam understood the excellence of the vow and it was her intention to submit everything in her life to its sanctifying influence. In November of 1926, Sister Miriam's condition was diagnosed as tonsillitis and she was operated on. When she returned to convent, the sisters noticed how weak she was and she admitted to being exhausted. The Mother Superior sent her to St. Elizabeth Hospital in Elizabeth to find out what was wrong. Her exhausting weakness continued. Her brother Charles had a premonition about her death and asked the Mother Superior for permission for his sister to make her vows as a Sister of Charity. Mother Alexandrine asked Father Benedict to receive the vows and he reported that Sister Miriam was overjoyed. I, Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovich, in the presence of God and the whole company of heaven, renew my promises of baptism and vow to God poverty, chastity, and obedience for life according to the Constitution of the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth. The hearse bearing Sister Miriam Teresa's body brought her home to convent and she was carried in to the sisters' parlor. When the cover was removed from the casket, Sister Miriam's friends were shocked when they saw the wasted form and the thin face. The Mother Superior asked one of her sister friends to put a smaller cap on her that would fit more closely to her face. When the other sisters were at supper, the sister changed the cap. She noticed the strange shape of the head. It was enlarged at the forehead with swellings around the head in the shape of a crown of thorns. Father Benedict revealed that she suffered the torment of the crown of thorns from February 1925 when she received the habit. Sister Miriam was buried at convent in the peaceful cemetery of the Sisters of Charity. Each grave was marked by a white cross. On her gravestone were written the dates of her birth and death. 
Sister Miriam Teresa lived from 1901 to 1927. She was only 26 when she died and had been a religious for only two years. As the months passed, the memory of Sister Miriam Teresa did not fade. After the publication of Greater Perfection in 1928, many requests came asking to know more about the author. Small leaflets were distributed with her picture and biography. Many people requested favors through Sister Miriam Teresa and many received them. Her devotees visited the grave and chipped pieces of stone from her cross to keep as mementos. Eventually, the gravestone had to be replaced. Canonization is the process whereby the Church declares that a person lived a holy life and is a saint. The process is a slow and deliberate one with precise documentation required. In 1945, the Bishop of Patterson, Thomas McLaughlin, began the process by petitioning Rome for permission to begin the investigative process for the cause of Sister Miriam Teresa on the diocesan level. In 1978, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints ordered that the remains of Sister Miriam Teresa be exhumed and placed in Holy Family Chapel. Bishop Frank Rodimer approved the proposed new site and on May 8, 1979, Reverend Stephen Finlay, the Vice Postulator of the cause, and Monsignor Herbert Tillier, the Chancellor for Bishop Rodimer, dug the first shovels of dirt to remove the remains from the cemetery. The new site for Sister Miriam's remains was on the left side of Holy Family Chapel. The crypt was built into the wall near Our Lady's altar. After the casket was placed inside, the crypt was sealed by an installation of six-inch bricks. The site is marked by a plaque which can be seen from the sanctuary. If you go up the stairs on the left side of Our Lady's altar, you find a special place near where Sister Miriam's mortal remains lie. There is a kneeler for praying and a place to write down the favors for which you want Sister Miriam to intercede. The next step in the canonization process was to have the cause move from the diocesan level to the level of the Universal Church in Rome. The Congregation for the Causes of Saints required that everyone still living who knew Sister Miriam be interviewed. Her writings had to be scrutinized to make sure there were no inconsistencies with the Church's teachings. Documents attesting to her holiness had to be signed and witnessed. This information was sent to Rome along with the request that the cause be introduced by the Apostolic See. In June 1980, Pope John Paul II gave approval and the cause of Miriam Teresa Demjanovic was introduced in Rome. Now the cause became the concern of the Universal Church and it was declared that the Church had no objection to the causes moving forward. At this time, Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovic was awarded the title Servant of God. When all the evidence had been gathered, it was time to write an academic position paper or positio. Sister Frances Maria Cassidy, Sister of Charity, and Sister Eileen Dolan, Sister of Charity, visited Rome where they consulted with the officials as they were writing the Positio. The first section was a complete, accurate biography of the candidate. The second section documented her virtues. It included letters, writings, and eyewitness accounts concerning her virtue, piety, faith, and charity. When it was finished, it had to be translated into Italian and sent to Rome. In order for the Church to declare a person blessed, there must be proof that a miracle occurred as a result of the intercession of the candidate. In 1963, a second grade boy in St. Anastasia School, Teaneck, was having difficulty seeing the board. Examination by an ophthalmologist revealed that he had juvenile macular degeneration. He was legally blind. 
The doctor recommended that his parents register him with the New Jersey Commission for the Blind. When the mother told Sister Mary Augustine, Sister of Charity, about the doctor's statement that there was nothing he could do medically to help the boy, Sister gave her a leaflet and a memento of Sister Miriam Teresa. They all prayed that his sight would improve. About two months later, the boy went back to the doctor who was amazed because the boy had 20-20 vision. This boy is now almost 50 years old and has 20-20 vision. He and his parents attribute this favor to the intercession of Sister Miriam. Here we see Dr. Mary Mazzarella de Mayo, MD, a 1955 graduate of the College of St. Elizabeth, consulting about the alleged miracle with Father James Fitzpatrick, the former postulator for the cause from Rome. In investigating the presumed miracle, Dr. Mazzarella contacted several ophthalmologists who supported the original doctor's diagnosis and were willing to testify that there was no medical explanation for the child's recovering perfect vision. In order for the cure to be declared miraculous, the disease condition must be established. The cure itself must be complete permanent and more rapid than normal. The cure must also take place in an atmosphere of prayer. Since the restoration of sight in the blind child took place in the Archdiocese of Newark, the official inquiry into the presumed miracle had to be conducted by the officials of that Archdiocese. This inquiry took place under the supervision of Archbishop John J. Myers, Archbishop of Newark. Testimonies were given and signed by the witnesses, including the man whose sight was restored and the ophthalmologist who examined him prior to their testimonies. These documents were transcribed and sent to Rome. When the Positio and the alleged miracle are accepted by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints in Rome, we will rejoice. Our sister Miriam Teresa will be beatified by the Pope and we will call her blessed. Pope John Paul II canonized over 280 saints that came from all over the world. We have only two American-born saints, Elizabeth Ann Seton and Catherine Drexel. Sister Miriam Teresa Demjanovic is a symbol of unity in the Church. By birth and culture, she is product of both the East and the West. She was baptized, confirmed, and made her first communion in the Byzantine Rite, which is united with Rome. As a young adult, she went to Mass and received communion in the Roman Catholic Rite. She made vows in a Roman Catholic community. Her cause unites the East and the West and gives us a sense of unity in the Universal Church. Sister Miriam Teresa is truly an apostle of unity. The final step in the cause after her beatification will be the canonization, which is a ceremony that takes place in Rome. Before this process can take place and Sister Miriam Teresa can be declared a saint by the Pope, another miracle is required. This second miracle must be granted after the beatification has taken place. of a potential saint requires skill in public relations. Most groups of supporters establish prayer guilds. They promise to pray for the canonization. They use lectures, educational videos, and school and parish visits to increase their candidates' visibility. In 1945, the Sister Miriam Teresa Prayer League was established to make the public more aware of her holy life. The sister who was the most instrumental in the founding of the Sister Miriam Teresa League of Prayer was Sister Mary Zita Geis, who was in the novitiate with Sister Miriam, and in 1929 wrote her first biography entitled Sister Miriam Teresa. She was capably assisted by Sister Anne Lucille Burns, who was the first secretary treasurer. The organization has flourished and today can boast of over 2,500 members. today rests in the able hands of Sister Marion Jose Smith. She is the Vice Postulator and Director of the League. 
She is responsible for the progress of the cause. She plans the meetings for the members and keeps close contact with the advisory board. She also edits the quarterly bulletin which is sent to all the members. This is an informative newsletter reporting on the progress of the cause and listing the favors that have been received and those that are being requested. This bulletin has articles that assist the members to lead holy lives and includes other timely topics of spiritual interest. To become a member of the Sister Miriam Teresa League of Prayer, fill out the blank on the back of the leaflet and mail it to the convent station address. With your membership, you can take upon yourself some obligations. You are requested to pray the Our Father daily for the success of the cause, or you can substitute 26, Glory be to the Fathers. In addition, you promise to offer a small sacrifice each day. You receive copies of the bulletin and some privileges. 100 Masses are offered each year for the members, and you are also remembered in the daily prayers of the Sisters of Charity. The Sister Miriam Teresa League of Prayer carries on the mission of Sister Miriam by encouraging people to live holy lives and reminding them of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in their souls. The League wants everyone to realize that they are called to holiness and that God holds out to them the graces for salvation and sanctification. God wants all of us to be saints.